Uh, Dr. Russell Reed. Rusty Reed is a husband, father, and IU neurology resident who grew up in Greentown, Indiana. He studied neurobiology at Purdue University and then received his medical school education at IU School of Medicine. And he intends to stay in Indianapolis to practice neurology after graduation next year. So please help me welcome Dr. Reed. For the kind introduction, I'm glad to meet all of you guys. Um, I, and thank you also for having me here to go over this uh, this interesting topic. Um, so I'm going to be speaking on Das Narenhaus in the faces of mental illness. Uh, as soon as I can get the cursor to advance the slides. Okay, so the uh, Das Narenhaus is German for the fool's house. Um, and it was engraved by Wilhelm von Kalbach in uh, around 1834. Uh, it's a picture broadly of uh, like the garden inside an asylum with a group of people surrounded by a uh, warden lurking in the background, um, mentally ill patients. Um, and it's a, I think that it's a challenging image to just look at uh, with one glance. I think that there are, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on within the image um, and you can really dive a lot deeper, uh, which is what caught my eye when I was here at the museum. Uh, I saw that this was a, an interesting photograph. Uh, it was actually an engraving by, by Wilhelm von Kalbach, um, but it's uh, something that you can, uh, take a, look, a closer look at the different faces. Uh, and that's what I intend to do tonight. Um, as Guido Gores stated uh, in um, an article about or, uh, an article about this engraving back in 1835, all the fools of his image call to the beholder, what you are, we once were, and what we are, you can become at any moment. So Wilhelm von Kalbach himself uh, commented in um, some of the, uh, his own personal letters about this image specifically. His daughter had collected some of his letters and published it in 1918. Um, and one of the quotes I found interesting was that it, he said, oh, it was so horrible, so sad. We young people had no idea of such destinies and had lived so calmly into the day. Now suddenly we got to know life and especially from the cruelest side. It is one of the most terrible days of my youth. It was uh, not uncommon in that time for uh, folks to go to an asylum as a form of entertainment. Um, they would charge, uh, you'd get, I think it was one shilling to go to Bedlam, to go see, just watch on the horrors of the, the people that were in the asylum. Um, and in the remainder of the presentation, I'll have a couple other paintings that depict a little bit of that. Um, but that's how he had the occasion to do this. Um, so he was in um, Dusseldorf, Germany, and a doctor had taken him to go see this uh, an asylum. And it's at least thought that this asylum is a representation of uh, what he recalled from seeing that. Um, for it, I thought also that it was interesting that he commented in another letter uh, that it was not only this specific uh, engraving, it was not only endlessly praised in lay circles and attracted attention, but also the doctors praised it as an exemplary for the studying psychiatrists. It was a scientific work that brought the individual types out of the picture and made interesting, instructive words about the various symptoms of illnesses. So even in its time, it, uh, Dr. Wilhelm noticed that this piece of work was being used by studying physicians um, to understand the various symptoms of illness. So I'm gonna start now by focusing in on a couple of key zones within the image. If you look um, in this, so I'll, before I zoom in again, just in the upper right-hand corner, I'm gonna focus in on these three characters. So starting with the gentleman on the left, um, or I suppose the, the two gentlemen here are, are both depicting something that looks to me like uh, religious sort of delusions. Um, so specifically the one on the left, he's got his ear tilted up to the sky, almost as if he's 
getting auditory hallucinations um, and the holding uh, of like the rosary beads, the gentleman to his right, uh, the one brandishing the cross, also having the fingers with the symbol of the cross um, is a stark contrast to the unkempt hair, uh, the intense gaze that he has, um, uh, conjuring some ideas of mania. And then the um, lady with her head down is uh, more of like, a, you could think of um, a, a delusion where she's just seeking to pray more more common or more often. Perhaps it's not necessarily, a, a, she has a mental illness. I think that's definitely up for debate. Um, and I'm not certain what could have gotten her there. Um, she might also be praying uh, to be safe from the situation that he's in, perhaps unjustly put into this environment. And as we progress a little bit farther into the corner, we can see that this warden, uh, I'm going to go back because I think with the stuff that we have in the corner there, it might be easier to see him. The warden is back in the corner, um, and I thought it was very interesting that Kalbach decided to paint him both further away and also in a darker light, uh, because if you can look even closer, I think it doesn't come across very well on this screen. But um, within, uh, on the wall, right around here, there's a stick figure uh, of the warden, and the, he's got uh, like a, just an evil, scary face. Um, this stick figure, is, it's, it's hard to see, but it's uh, obvious in this, with what is drawn on the wall, that the people within the asylum were not uh, particularly fond of the warden. And uh, it's also, I think, speaks to sort of a persecutory delusion uh, where people are trapped within their own mind uh, and have this, this thing that is distancing them from society, this like dark presence that is sort of keeping them back, keeping them away. As we keep coming around, down into the bottom right corner, I wanted to focus in on these four characters. Um, so first, the gentleman that's scratching his head and pointing out, um, there was uh, someone else that had um, in 1913 described some of this picture. Um, Mr. Navini uh, had or described this gentleman specifically as a man disgustingly run down by debauchery covered with a disgusting rash. Uh, and with the intense gaze that he has, some of the gauntly features, um, it, it, one of my thoughts is that this could represent neurosyphilis with some of the psychiatric um, manifestations and late syphilis, uh, in addition to uh, the, like the rash that he has um, and the comment of uh, run down by debauchery with it being a sexually transmitted infection. And then you come down to the bottom right, um, and it's a disturbing picture of uh, a poor lady that is holding a swaddled log, um, which really makes you think about uh, a desperate mother robbed of her mind in this um, sort of uh, postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis. Um, perhaps this, uh, this unfortunate lady had lost a child in birth uh, and is now suffering the consequences which uh, put her in this uh, facility. And then you look over to the gentleman uh, just to the left of the, the one I'm proposing to have neurosyphilis. He has even more gauntly features. His eyes are down, uh, this almost a psychomotor retardation uh, in combination with the sense of apathy, uh, disconnection, it appears that he's lost sleep. Uh, he's also lost weight with some of the temporal wasting. I think some of these features are features that you see in patients that have depression, um, that are uh, that have just been depressed for long enough that they've lost some muscle mass, they've not been able to eat. Um, and then I think that the gentleman in the bottom uh, with his head down holding a piece of paper um, one of the proposed things is uh, perhaps 
perhaps he's suffering from an adjustment disorder uh, or an acute stress reaction, perhaps something in his life just uh, devastated him out of proportion to what uh, a normal life stressor would have done. Then as you make your way around uh, to the left side of the, the image, what I think you start to see over here is a little bit different sort of uh, symptoms. These folks are, I think, struggling with the ability to control their anger, uh, also having some uh, almost a sexually provocative sort of appearance to them, uh, sexually inappropriate, climbing on, the, climbing on each other. Um, and I think that these are uh, depictions of uh, people with perhaps personality disorders as well as um, other um, um, things like the mania as well. And then as we come to the center here, draw your attention to the, the figure that everybody has uh, painted around or engraved around um, this central character. Um, First, we'll talk about the gentleman over to the to his uh, his left uh, on the right side there with the paper crown and holding the stick. Uh, I think is a, like a grandiosity, delusion of grandeur um, when people have these thoughts that they are the king or that they are royalty. Um, the but then I think that this center character. I'll come back here just to sort of highlight its. You can almost see that your eyes are drawn in to this middle character. Um, I, I think that if you look at a self-portrait of Wilhelm von Kohlbach, you'll see a striking resemblance. Uh, perhaps it's just the mustache, but I, I think that it's, in my opinion, I, I almost feel like he's drawn himself in this uh, amidst the chaos that's surrounding it. Um, and I bring that up because uh, I do, so he wrote about, or his daughter actually wrote about um, ben, Wilhelm suffering from deep melancholy, some depression, um, and he actually spoke about this work, or he wrote about this work uh, as something that helped him recover uh, through the, the medium of art, he was able to recover some of his own mental illness, uh, and, and so I think that it not only does it depict uh, just some really great different faces of mental illness, but it also, I think, speaks to the power of art uh, and its ability to, to heal the mind, heal the soul. Um, so a little bit more about Wilhelm von Kalbach. He was a German painter and muralist, uh, born in Arlsen in October, died in April in Munich. Uh, so a, a German uh, that studied in the Dusseldorf Academy of Fine Arts. Um, started there at 17 years old. His father was a goldsmith uh, and had helped him. Uh, his father had worked pretty hard to be able to get his son an education and uh, set his son up for success. Uh, and success fo or followed uh, under the directorship of Peter von Cornelius. He became uh, eventually the director of the Bavarian Academy in Munich in 1849. He also was an illustrator for other famous um, um, uh, folks such as Goethe and Shakespeare. And I've got some images here of some of the other works from Wilhelm von Kalbach. The, uh, this center one, the Gretchen under Our Lady of Sorrows was one of the um, illustrations that he did for Goethe. Um, and then uh, I just thought that this bottom thing um, was, I, I didn't look into where it is currently, where these images are current, like the uh, reproductions of these are, but um, I, I thought that this was an interesting, uh, he was conscripted uh, by the church to do some of these works, uh, also did some of those work uh, just as for private folks as well. Um, and I think that time would allow me to this uh, so this image uh, one uh, made me want to dig a little bit deeper into the history of a uh, brief history of the asylum as well, just in general what the asylum um, looks like and it so it's kind of cut off there, but I divided it into some broad strokes: the medieval era, 
the 16th century, 18th century, 19th century, and 20th century. So starting in the medieval era, they uh, treated the insane, when I say treated uh, with the quotations, um, uh, were treated uh, by their families or by uh, monks in the monastery. Um, and it was often viewed as a demonic possession. Uh, and so the treatment was exorcism or punishment, such as putting them in the branks or whipping post in the stocks. Um, if you know of any lunatics in the family, you could give them clove wart, wreath, uh, red thread around the neck, uh, only when the moon is on the wane, taken in the month uh, of April or early part of October, and uh, you might be able to heal your loved one um, if we follow this medicinal cure. Or you could take them over to St. Fillion's Well in Scotland. Uh, the, so 200 people per year would go to this place to find the benefits of the uh, salutary influence. They would walk around the well three times, give an offering, uh, immerse their loved one three times, bind their hands and feet, and then leave them in the chapel uh, overnight. Um, and then specifically what I read was that if the maniac is found loose in the morning, good hopes are conceived of his full recovery. If he is still bound, his cure remains doubtful. And sometimes it happens that the death relieves him during his confinement from the troubles of life. Uh, so we did improve a little bit in the 16th century with the uh, advent of the private asylums. Probably the most notorious would be Bedlam or Bethlehem Hospital in uh, Britain. It was uh, first established as a priory in 1247, uh, but it didn't seem clear that psychiatric patients appeared at this facility until uh, much later. So in 1403, there were um, lunatics that were chained, just kind of as we had seen uh, in that previous slide, more the medieval era. And then the facility was enlarged in 1632 and remained uh, that way for some time. This is just a map uh, in 1560 that I could find um, of the facility. Fast forward uh, a couple of centuries and uh, at Bedlam, the treatment in 1783 um, was that the uh, patients there were bled in late May, according to the weather, then they would take their vomits once a week for a certain number of weeks. And after that, they were purged. Um, so it was, I suppose, a little bit more medical at this point, uh, looking into the humors and um, moving things, uh, but it, it certainly not quite what we see now. And you can see in this, uh, what I had mentioned earlier, so William Hogarth in uh, his series of Rake's Progress, one of the paintings was the madhouse. Um, and you can see in the background, so in the foreground, there are the mentally ill patients. Um, and then in the background, you can see the erudite socialites that are coming in here to uh, view these people as a, a form of entertainment. You move forward into the 18th century and uh, Philippe Pinel and the Quaker William Took um, argued for some moral reform. They saw these places like Bedlam and the destitute situations, and they were pushing for a changed attitude toward the treatment of the mentally ill. Um, and it was generating the thought that compassionate treatment uh, might help with the rehabilitation of those folks with mental illness. What we see in this image is a, a painting of La Salpentrée and one of the hospitals where um, uh, painted by Tony Robert Fleury. Um, again, not necessarily uh, a depiction of great situation with the, the mentally ill patients here over to the left. Fast forward again to this 19th century. Um, and we were uh, moving toward an, uh, an era of institutionalization. So this was uh, under the thought that the private institution was uh, failing to provide the necessary treatment, the necessary facility. Uh, and so then it became a state-led effort to establish these public mental asylums, um, which uh, is another thing that kind of brings this facility into the picture as well. Um, so it was created to oversee better living conditions, 
Uh, the Indiana Hospital for the Insane opened in 1848 uh, and then later changed its name in 1927 to the Central State Hospital, um, which is perhaps what is, is more commonly known as. Um, and we can see in uh, another a painting by Francisco de Goya in 1872, um, a house of the, the crazy with, uh, even at that time um, in the 19th century, it wasn't necessarily uh, great conditions in all the places. Um, so then we move forward into the 20th century with the idea of deinstitutionalization. De um, asylums again became notorious for poor living conditions, overcrowding, abuse uh, and poor treatment. And then we also had the advent, uh, the invention of neuroleptics. So Thorazine um, as depicted here, uh, uh, one of the advertisements for the Thorazine. In addition to the emergence of community-based alternatives. Um, and so what we started to see within the 20th century is that the, these state-led institutions started to dissolve uh, and go more into the community-based organizations. Um, and so kind of taking a step back again, it was it started in the homes of people, uh, the homes and the churches, and then the pendulum swung into a private institution. Um, and then it uh, kind of stayed, the pendulum stayed over here in a, a state-led institution, uh, but then the pendulum swung back and we're now closer, I think, to where we were almost in the medieval era, at least in terms of where these people are treated, um, but not, I, I, I would argue that we're, we're, we're not putting people in stocks and chains um, that this, I do think that the treatment specifically for the mental illnesses has improved greatly. Um, but it's a, I think that there's still room to grow. Um, and I think that a, a question that I don't know if we've found a good answer over this many centuries as to whether uh, an institutionalization um, is, is the right answer to try to take care of these folks and perhaps um, with a, a different state-led organization or perhaps another private institution might be able to come up with a solution uh, to, to take the best care um, versus uh, this community-based alternatives. Um, and I, I, I'm not certain exactly where I would stand on that and invite other, th other people's thoughts about it as well. Um, and with that, I'll show you my references. This is the end of my presentation.